Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Amen. The love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Direct us, O Lord God, in all our doings with your continual help, that in all our works, begun, continued, and ended in you, we may glorify your holy name. And finally, by your mercy, bring us to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us listen for God's word as we read from the book of Deuteronomy. See, I have set before you to today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways and observing his commandments, decrees and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away from <clears throat> and you do not hear, but are led away to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him, for that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give your ancestors to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The word of the Lord. Let us continue to listen as we read responsibly from Psalm 1. Happy are those who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked or lingered in the way of sinners or sat in the seat of the scornful. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, 
nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. Let us continue to listen as we read from Paul's letter to Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker. To Aphria, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God, because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith towards the Lord Jesus. I pray that sharing of your faith may may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because of the hearts of the saints that have been refreshed through your through you my brother and for this reason though i am bold enough in christ to command you to do your duty yet i would rather appeal to you on the basis of love and i paul do this as an old man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I'm appealing to you, my child, Ones- for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I want to keep... I wanted to keep him for me so that he might be of service to me in your, in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But, but, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while so that you might have him back forever no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but now how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I Paul am about <clears throat> I Paul am writing this with my own hand I will repay it I say and I say nothing about you owing me even your own self Yes brother let me have this benefit from you in <clears throat> in the Lord refresh my heart in Christ confident of your obedience I am writing to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel on this day according to Luke. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And he turned and said to them, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, All who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able, with 10,000, 
to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. The gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, you, O Christ. Christ. Please be seated. And don't you wish there was a sermon related to this gospel? Oh man, the bar is pretty high. Separate from family. Pick up your own cross. Give up your possessions, all of them. I know that I have not done that. (laughs) And yet... The God who calls me and calls all of us into a life of discipleship is gracious and merciful and is willing to accompany us all the way through life and in fact has already granted us life and the opportunity to to be part of of the promotion of life all around us. So our sermon today is about how we have been engaged and um, accompanying the community's in and around Wenatchee. And um, it's important to, I think what you'll hear is, is rather than coming in with a, I'm here to give you something and help you out kind of message, uh, what we have really committed to do is to come right alongside the people who are perhaps in a, in a rougher situation than ourselves. Um, more needy, and to, and to simply get to know them, first of all, as human beings. And then through those simple relationships of friendship, begin to see how God is already at work. So um, I won't take any more time, and I want to uh, pass this now on to Beth. Would you like to just use this microphone, or? Yeah, okay, all right. So thank you, Beth, for helping us through this time. We're really grateful for all of this. Hi, um, my name is Courtney Brown, and I was working with the sports groups, and we went to migrant camps in East Wenatchee and Malaga. This is our flag that we made. We chose the name okay, I'm gonna move this one here, because um, we were playing soccer and basketball, and in Minnesota, they have a soccer team called the United, and in Washington, we have the Seattle Storm. So we were like, hey, Let's merge it together because that's what we're doing. We're bridging the gap between our communities. So we made this and it hung in the fellowship hall all week. And um, in my opinion, it was the best sign, but um, <laughs> yeah. So this is our flag that we had and I wanted to use it as a prop because I think it's pretty cool. So um, thank you for holding this. <laughs> so, uh, we, I was part of the soccer group, and we went to the Malaga uh, migrant camp. And while we were there, um, we had um, kids show up as time passed. We would be there from 3.30 to 5.30 every day. And um, the first day, we didn't have very many kids show up. In fact, the soccer group didn't have any show up, but the basketball had a couple. And as the week progressed, um, people started to notice that we were there every day. We were there to play with them, we had soccer balls and basketballs, and we were there to, we were there. So um, gradually, um, more kids started to show up. Um, as the week progressed, the uh, most interesting thing that I found was uh, how we were able to um, communicate effectively even with um, a language barrier. Mm, Mackenzie, and I, Mackenzie took four years of Spanish um, and I took three years. So both of us were able to hold a relatively good conversation in Spanish. And um, many of these kids and many of these families only spoke Spanish. So that was really helpful as we could um, help communicate with them about why we were there and um, what church we were from. And the basketball group had um, Cade, he's um, from Lowry, Minnesota, and he um, is, I think he took four years of Spanish, and he was very proficient, and um, the kids just loved him, 
and uh, he was able to stay an extra day, especially after um, their group had to leave a little bit early. And um, he would go to street ministry in the morning and then come help us with sports in the afternoon. So he had a full day packed, but he helped us um, in amazing ways. So because of this barrier, we were able to not break it, but like we were able to communicate very well, and um, that helped a lot. Um, also, on midway through the week, um, the congregation helped uh, us have a shave ice truck come, and that was really fun because that helped um, people come out from the apartments in the migrant camps um, where all the families stay. So the shave ice truck, it was free and they could have as many as they wanted for the whole time that we were there. So um, the fun part about that was um, we had more kids come and play with us because they saw us out there with basketballs and soccer balls. And um, there was this one little kid actually, he came and he went back to the shave ice truck like five or six times and you know, trying different flavors every time. And at one point he was, um, he pointed at me and he's like, here. And he had me hold his, um, snow cone until he was done playing a game but so at the end, so I was like okay and so I just held it um my hand was a little sticky at the end of that day but um it was definitely worth it and he was um very excited that we had shave ice um the memory that I think um is most important to me from this week is um the second day the kid that we had the first um for the first hour or so by himself his name was Kevin he um, was there, and we played basketball. We played a little bit of soccer. He really, really liked basketball, though, and um, he connected really well with us, and he um, shared a lot of his life with us. Um, many of the children that were in the migrant camps moved here with their families from California for the summer, and when they moved back to California, um, they moved when the season was over. So... Um, a lot of them called their apartments that they were staying in cabins, and that was interesting for me just because when I think of a cabin, I have a cabin up at Lake Chelan. Like, that's my cabin. It's like, oh, vacation time. I get to go for a week, you know, play in the water. Then it's like, okay, I'm coming here. I'm going to stay here. Um, I'm probably only going to be here really to sleep because I'm going to be working every other hour that I'm here. That was really interesting for me just because... Um, they're coming here to work, not play, and we were able to give them two hours of play at the end of the day. So Kevin also told us that um, he was nine, I think he was nine or ten, and um, he'd been working with his parents since he was five years old. Um, I'm 16. Not, I, when I was 16, I started working. So he had been working already longer than I had. I um, which was amazing to me because I work cherries and that's really hard work. I can't imagine doing that if I was five because at 16 and 17, it's really hard. <laughs> so um, the fact that he was able to do that and then come out and play with us was um, showed his strength and um, was really eye-opening for me. Um, throughout this week, um, this summer, I was able to build my knowledge off of what I learned in San Francisco a couple years ago. And um, I learned that we were there to offer them someone to listen, someone to play with, and someone to just be there without any judgment and just be there, which is the best thing I think we could offer for them. Um, thank you so much for allowing us to go on this um, trip through Wenatchee. It wouldn't have been able to um, happen without all of your support and um, donate. Um, I am going to share a little bit um, from Denise Miller. She wrote about her time that she shared with us um, during the summer of service. So she writes... Thanks be to God that Grace Lutheran has youth and leadership to provide such a special summer of service program. I was thrilled to hear that Grace would be hosting in Wenatchee this year. It was a perfect chance to invite more of our congregation to take part in activities. 
Even if you had a full-time job that week, there were still opportunities to lend a hand. I spent some evening time in the kitchen as well as time at the dinner table. I listened to stories from the daytime groups back from their day of sharing God's love, God's love with others. Great memories were made, new friendships were formed. It warmed my heart to see John Brett, Pastor Bethany, Pastor Joe, and Pastor Sierra. What a blessing that Minnesota youth also learned about summer of service, Wenatchee style. I do believe I heard some kids had never had an opportunity like summer of service before 2019. I wish I could have spent more time volunteering that week in June, but I'm so grateful to be able to participate in some small way. Thank you for hosting. And that's from Denise. I will be sharing on behalf of Molly Salter, who is out of town for a family wedding. Um, so. The local ministry that I helped with was street ministry, run through the Women's Resource Center. Our group, made up of six kids from four different churches, were driven around East Wenatchee and Wenatchee by our guide, Victor Estrada, who searched out people on the street. We drove through parking lots, alleys, parks, down by the river, behind stores, and in some of the most remote places in our valley. For each person we met, we gave them a hygiene bag and some food and water and asked if we could talk to them. Some of the most impactful people I met were those outside of certain ministries around town who had been refused service because they had pets or because they were accused of demanding more food than they deserved or they needed. These people were irritated but surprisingly forgiving towards the services that had denied them help. The only one person that had something to say about it said that he had to show grace and forgiveness to them, even if they didn't show any in return. He was obviously looking for help in the right place as long as he had a community to help him out. While we were out, I began to notice the difference between homeless people in Wenatchee and the homeless people we met in San Francisco two years ago, and one thing struck me above anything else. The homeless community in Wenatchee and in East Wenatchee works like a family unit. Most people who had pets could easily find someone willing to keep their animal while they went to work or another commitment. More than one person we talked to said they ha helped homeless students study. If anyone had extra food or water or hygiene products, they would share them with others who didn't have those. These are only a few examples of the things we saw. The reason I think this impacted me is because even after getting to know homeless people in several different places, these are new things that I learned that I hadn't considered before. Many homeless students cannot do homework because they don't have a quiet place to focus or a table to do their work on. And people with pets are unable to pay for someone to watch their pet when they have to go somewhere. It was incredible to see how the homeless community took care, takes care of each other under every circumstance. Another thing I found interesting was the sense of pride people had. This was something I wasn't expecting, but, and most of the people we spoke with said that they were proud of one thing or another. One woman said she was proud of her friends for working to get into stable housing. Another said she was proud of her race and heritage despite the fact that many people hated her because of it. A few different people said they were proud of their education, some self-taught, and others who worked hard to stay in school. No matter what they were proud of, all of them were excited to share their accomplishments or those of their friends. Many of us students take our education for granted because it is not a challenge for us to stay in school long enough to graduate. It is not hard for us to get to or get home from school, and most of us have parents or guardians who are able to help us with our homework. I can't think of a time before speaking with these people that I've ever heard someone say how proud they were to be able to read and write, to do the math that's required from day to day, or have any sort of skills they could put on a resume. One woman even said that she was proud to be a tutor to homeless students specifically because she had only received up to a seventh grade education. 
but she got a dictionary and she got a Bible and memorized the definition to every word in the Bible that she didn't know. She also said something to our group that she wanted everyone to know. She said, I'm glad and so proud to be sharing God's word with you. Someone told me when I was just a little girl without a home that when you seek to learn God's word, he will, later, he will then later in your life give you the honor of teaching it. And look at me now, getting to be the vessel carrying God's word to such beautiful hearted people. Soon this can be you. And as you already know, telling other people what God wants them to hear is such a great honor. These are things that I only could have seen and learned on the streets of Wenatchee because it felt like I was walking into someone's home to learn about them, which is usually better than when they have to come talk to, me, talk to you about it themselves, their struggles, and their accompl accomplishments. I got to see firsthand how the people that live in our community take care of each other, especially when they're rejected from shelters or housing units. I think the way these people operate like a family is an important model to learn from, especially when we live in a growing community like our own. I originally decided that I would share the sense of community that I felt when one of the people we spoke to said he wished people privileged enough to ignore the homeless in their town would wake up and realize it was an unfair gift to be able to ignore people. He said he cannot ignore anyone because he knows what it feels like to not be looked at once for over 24 hours sitting on a busy street corner. He challenged all of us to make as many people as possible feel seen in one day. So I'm going to challenge all of you to do the same. Practice making a conscious effort to look someone in the eye and smile or wave as you walk by or if you drive by them. This is important everywhere, if it's in the school hallways, the grocery store, or anywhere else you are in the community. There are always going to be those people that need to be seen and need to be felt like they matter. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dane Schmidt, and I was part of the team that got to go down to the Bruce Hotel and have arts and crafts time with the kids and then take them to the park. Um, so, something that I found really interesting was um, when Pastor James was giving the gospel today, he mentioned about how, you know, these people have had to leave everything behind and find new shelter and a new home but one thing that the kid that at least the kids certainly didn't leave behind was a sense of optimism that I don't think I've ever seen before I got to work with one little girl almost every day named Maya and she was so excited that we would come every day she's a very she love doing the arts and crafts. She's a very kind of crafty person. And she had one little idea that um, was able to keep her happy. And that was, she would tell me every day about how she knew that they were homeless, but she really wanted a cat for her birthday. And she was able to use that idea of this cat to give her hope and then when we would go to the park um, it was really cool for me because I mean it's not like they weren't kids but they definitely were um, they were almost more serious than you would expect kids to be when they were at the hotel because a lot of them understood the severity of the situation. But when we went to the park, they were running around and they were playing. And you could tell what a break from their reality it was from them. And that was just so amazing to see. And another really cool memory I have is our last night with them, we also ordered the shave ice truck 
and we had a huge chicken barbecue dinner for the kids. And, you know, we had kind of been telling the kids all day just to kind of prepare them that, you know, this is our last day. We're not coming back tomorrow. So as we're all packing up and getting ready to leave, um, I look over, and one of the little boys, um, his name is Joshua, he is sitting over, huddled in the corner by a dumpster, and he's crying because he doesn't want us to go. So that was kind of a really cool opportunity for me to go over there and put my arm around him and share God's love with somebody that was feeling kind of alone. And then that night, um, once we got back to the church, we were encouraged to share a prayer for those people we'd met during the week. And I found myself moved to tears at that moment just by thinking of these kids who in the face of these horrible, horrible situations, we're able to find happiness and optimism. And in most cases, they were more optimistic than their parents, and that was really cool for me to see. And I think kind of the takeaway from this is that you don't have to go and donate money or give a child a home. Sometimes all, it need, sometimes all it takes is a little coloring book or just a hi, how are you? Or sometimes it's taking a kid to a park and putting a Nerf gun in his hand. Thank you. Um, my alter ego is also at a wedding in Spokane. Um, but Shannon wanted to share, and so I'll be reading um, what she's sharing. This summer of service was different than any other trip that I have gone on because I was given the opportunity to be a mentor. I was put in charge of mentoring two groups, one volunteering at Powerhouse Ministry Center and the other doing street ministry with Victor Estrada from the Women's Resource Center. Each day, our two groups would go out and then meet later to discuss everything we had experienced and learn that day. I joined my group to, the, to volunteer at the Powerhouse. For those of you who don't know, Powerhouse is a low-barrier day shelter offering food, a shower, a place to do laundry, and much more. Each day when we arrived, we were assigned jobs, some sitting at the front desk signing people in, keeping a shower and laundry schedule, setting out some of the hygiene kits we made, and getting people any supplies they needed. Others were given a job in the kitchen serving food and coffee to whoever needed it, organizing the donated clothes, or helping to do yard work around the building. On the last day, our group was allowed to paint a mural on the front of the building that was designed by our group with the help of Megan Johnson. We chose to put the verse, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. In the mural, because we felt it per went perfectly with the Powerhouse Ministry Center's mission. But no matter what our job was, we were there to talk to people and make connections. Right away, as the doors opened, the people started coming in. I was blown away by the sense of community. As each per person walked in, they were happily greeted and immediately asked how they were doing. Later, I was talking with a woman who explained to me that her family doesn't care where she is or how she is doing, but if I don't show up here, she told me, these people come looking for me. Imagine your family not caring about you, and yet she found a family right here who will love, accept, and care for her right where she needed them. Our group really came to experience this sense of community on our second day volunteering when we encountered a man who did not have the best attitude toward the group. Earlier in the day, we had a small misunderstanding with him on the bus ride to Powerhouse. But when he continued his bad attitude toward us in the Powerhouse, 
a couple of ladies who come every day explain to him he should be grateful for us because Powerhouse would not be open if we were not volunteering. It was amazing to me that after one day we had been accepted into their community. Not many places I have been to would do that. And I was grateful for how loving and kind these people were. As I got to know everyone better, I heard stories of how a series of events had caused some of them to become homeless. How one man had been prom king back in the high school. Or of, one, of how one man had found somewhere, found somewhere he and his dog could move into. I heard three of the men who had known each other since kindergarten joking around. And, I wished a woman, and they wished a woman good luck as she showered and got ready for an interview. I even listened as women were buying paint as we were... Ugh. I even listened as the woman we were buying paint from thanked us for all we were doing at Powerhouse because not too long ago she would have needed those services. Each night when our group got together, I would ask everyone to share a story from the day of something they had seen or heard that day that had impacted them. We would all share stories and pictures of the dogs we met, then get excited when we realized we had met some of the same people. It was amazing for me as a mentor to watch my group of 16 from five different churches learn and grow together. When we first got together, many people in my group wouldn't talk to anyone, and a couple just wanted to goof around and not work. We all know who they were. Um, but by the end, the ones who were shy spent the whole day talking, laughing, and playing pool with people at the powerhouse. And those who didn't want to work were asking Candy if they could work at the front desk. On our final day, I asked my group to share what they will be taking home with them or even back to their church, and I, was and I was amazed by some of the things they shared. Many shared that they had learned that these people are in a position they are in, not because of anything they did or because they are lazy, but due to many unfortunate events. Someone explained that he had come to realize that it is not us and them, they are just as much people as we are, no less. Others shared that they had realized that we all may know someone who is homeless and not even realize it. Many also shared that they had wanted to go home and, wanted to go home and learn what services their community provides to the homeless and wanted to know what they as a church could do to help. I shared how many of the people in Powerhouse had volunteered there just to keep it open and able to use it. It made me realize how we as a community can do more to help out. I would, this is from Shannon, but also from me. I would encourage you to talk to Candy Cook to learn more about Powerhouse and their mission because it is an amazing organization run by amazing people. Finally, I would like to thank you for supporting all of our fundraisers that allow us to go on these trips. Do God's work, learn and grow and have these great experiences. If you knew me, I'm back to Shannon now, if you knew me when I first started going on these trips, I was the kid that didn't talk to anyone. But now I just had an amazing opportunity to mentor a group of people. Thank you. I just want to briefly say thank you. Um, it takes a village, and we definitely this summer had a village here in every sense of the word, whether it was the tents outside, the people inside cooking, um, Cooper and Rich keeping the facility clean, people doing security. Um, it truly was a village, and um, I just I can't thank everyone enough for your support in this venture. Thanks.